I'm Quincy Newell, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Quincy Newell. She has a new book out called Your Sister in the Gospel, uh, the life of Jane Manning James, a 19th century black Mormon. So I'm actually going to be giving away a copy of this book uh, in our last episode. Uh, there'll be five parts. So this is part one. And so if you'd like to get the co- if you'd like to get this book right here, please sign up for my newsletter at gospeltangents.com slash newsletter, and I'll have another drawing, and you can win this book right here. So Dr. Newell is very different than many of my other guests, all of my other guests up to this point. She's my first non-Mormon historian, and so we're going to learn more about her background and why she decided to write this wonderful book on Jane Manning James. It's a fantastic book. So check out our conversation. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm really excited. We have a guest all the way from New York. Can you go ahead and tell us who you are? Sure. My name is Quincy Newell. I'm an associate professor of religious studies at Hamilton College, and I am the author of Your Sister in the Gospel, the, I forget the subtitle, The Life of Jane Elizabeth, Jane Manning James... A 19th century black Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited. I don't know if you know, but my very first podcast was the subject was Jane Manning James. And I, do you know Margaret Young? I do know Margaret. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is exciting. We're, we're going full circle now. So <laughs> Margaret was one of the first people I met when I got uh, into the subject of black Mormons. Um, and so she and Darius Gray have been really great supports throughout this research process. Well, yeah, and I know she's just doing a film. I'll give Margaret a plug, although this is probably going to be a few months before it gets out, but she's just got the Africa is Rising or something, and it's in two weeks. It's in, it's a, going to be at BYU, so I know most people are probably going to be hearing this after the fact, but uh, Margaret's, Margaret's awesome, one of my favorite. So, well, that's cool. So, um, I believe that you didn't start your, can you give us a little bit about your academic career? Because I think you were in Wyoming for a time. Is that right? I was in Wyoming for a long time, actually. Um, I did my graduate degree at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I was working with Lori Mathley Kipp. Oh, okay. um, and my first job after graduate school was a position at the University of Wyoming uh, okay. in the Religious now, Studies Department. Before you go too far, mm-hmm. how, how many interactions did you have with Bart Ehrman? Uh, not a lot. Okay. Um, I knew Bart and he knew me because he was the chair of the department for a time while I was there. But he worked on stuff and in languages that I didn't even dare to touch. <laughs> um, so we mostly, you know, he's a friendly guy. He's a yeah. nice guy. So, um, but that's about as much as I knew I him. really want to get him on the podcast sometime. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. So you graduated from UNC. So you're a Tar Heel. I'm a Tar Heel. Um, you follow the basketball team? Not at all. Their football team is not very good. So um, Their women's soccer team is quite amazing. Oh, wow. Um, so, um, and then I was at the University of Wyoming for 11 years on the faculty there. Um, and four years ago, I went to Hamilton College, where I'm on the faculty now okay. in upstate New York. Okay. Well, cool. Very close to uh, Palmyra or anything? Yeah, about two hours from Rochester. Okay. Um, so I actually take students on a field trip to all the LDS historic sites in the oh, Palmyra nice. area. Um, Usually every fall, um, if I can manage it. So, yeah. So, I, I think one of the things that's most perplexing to me, um, and I think my listeners as well, you're not Mormon. No, I'm not. Why in the world are you studying Mormonism? I am interested in religion in the American West, and Mormons are a huge part of that story. Um, and I'm also interested in the experiences of religious and racial ethnic minorities. Um, so thinking about sort of how those different factors in identity intersect and how they shape people's lives. Um, and so that's why I got into the study of Mormonism. Well, that's cool. That's very cool. So I'm excited to talk, to talk about your book. And I, I have a lot of questions, uh, mostly from Margaret, that, that I think you, you can kind of clear up there. Okay. So, <laughs> so we'll let's see what I can do. Book, yeah. <laughs> So uh, let's talk a little bit about growing up. You know, I think most Mormons, you know, we always wonder the, the slave background of either Jane or her parents. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Jane was not a slave, and she was very particular in making sure that everybody knew that. Um, she was born free in Connecticut uh, in about 1820. 
Her mother had been enslaved, and she said that her grandmother, her maternal grandmother, had been brought from Africa um, as a, an enslaved woman as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so Jane certainly had slavery in her background. She knew about it. She experienced it. She knew people who had been enslaved. Um, but she herself was not enslaved at any point. Um, and she would, that, that's a status symbol, I think, for her. So she was very particular in making sure that people who knew her, people who heard about her, um, knew that she was not enslaved. Um, and that was important to her. Yeah, well, that's cool. So, um, so, but her mother was a slave. So how did, how did that work? I, I, there was, I think there was a law or something that you were emancipated at a certain age or something. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get all the details right off the top of my head. Um, but Connecticut passed a, a set of laws um, that basically instituted a kind of gradual eman emancipation. Um, so Jane's grand, I don't remember the year in which they were passed, but um, Jane's grandmother was too old and so was never emancipated um, because the legislature in Connecticut decided they didn't want um, owners of slaves to sort of dump their uh, aged slaves on the public um, trust and, and make the public responsible for maintaining them. Um, so they remained enslaved for the rest of their lives. Um, but there was a, a date certain that um, anybody born after that date was to be emancipated um, by, I think, their 25th birthday, something like that. And so Jane's mother was eligible for that emancipation. Um, and for that reason, probably was emancipated in around 1810 or so. Um, so Jane was born about 10 years later, so she was born free. Um, but uh, she certainly knew relatives who would have remained enslaved for the rest of their lives. Wow, that must have been tough. That must have been, I can't imagine. I, th I think it really was. Um, the other thing to know about Jane is that when she was very young, her father died. Um, and then she went to work for a wealthy white family. Um, she tells us this in her autobiography. Um, my guess is that she was probably indentured to that family. So she was about six years old, and she was essentially sort of signed over to this white family that lived about six miles away from her family's home. Um, and she worked for them until she was... 18 or 20 years old, um, and that was by contract. The family had to provide her with a place to, to sleep and clothing and maybe a little bit of education, um, but it, the difference between indenture and slavery was not all that big. Um, so there was a kind of spectrum of labor, free to unfree, um, and a lot of points in the middle um, that Jane occupied some of those at various points during her life. So I guess we would call it corporal punishment. I mean, was she? Do you, do you have any sense if she was punished severely at any we, time? We don't know. She never talks about that, um, and so so we don't have a good sense of sort of what her life was like in terms of kind of day to day um, interactions with the people that she worked for um, during that time in her life. She doesn't talk about um, Mr. or Mrs. Fitch really at all um, to give us a sense of what what they were like. Um, but Mr. Fitch died in, I think, 1833. Um, so that would have been maybe 10 years after she went to work for them, maybe a little bit less. Um, and she continued working for Mrs. Fitch for some time thereafter. Um, and that's partly why I think it might have been an indenture, um, because there would have been a contract there that would have said Mrs. Fitch has to keep employing her. Um, whereas Mrs. Fitch might have thought, you know, I could economize a little bit and move in with one of my children or something like that and not uh, maintain this servant. Um, so my suspicion is that there was some sort of previously agreed contract there that um, required that Jane continue working for Mrs. Fitch. Did she have a lot of interactions with her own mother in this time? Yeah, you know? It's really hard to tell. We know that Jane gave birth to a son in about 1839. We don't know, we have no idea who the father was. Um, and it looks like Jane may have left um, that son, Sylvester, with her mother for a time while she was working for Mrs. Fitch or for other people um, in New Canaan. Um, so in that sense, yeah, she would have had pretty close interactions with her mother. Her mother may have helped with the birth, in fact. Okay. Um, but 
we don't know how often she would have seen her mother on a kind of regular basis, whether she went home, you know, daily or weekly or monthly or at all. Okay. Well, interesting. So do we know what church she grew up in? Jane, uh, it looks like didn't grow up in a church. Um, she joined the Congregational Church of New Canaan in 1841. Her mother had been baptized in the Wilton Congregational Church, Jane's, home, Jane's hometown, um, before Jane was born as a servant, the colored servant of Ebenezer Abbott, her, the slave master who owned her. Um, and so it looks like Jane's parents didn't have her or any of their children baptized. Um, and so Jane, as a young woman, having already given birth to a, a baby boy, um, then accepts baptism in the congregational church to which the woman for whom she works also belongs. Um, and that is, she never explains why she does that. Um, I suspect that she may have needed to reassure Mrs. Fitch that she was a, a woman of upstanding character after having given birth to a child out of wedlock. Um, this might have been a way to, to sort of reassure her employer that she wasn't, um, you know, a loose woman, something like that. Um, she may also have wanted access to the church's disciplinary system if she wanted to bring charges against her son's father or some other local man. Um, she might have been persuaded by the church's message. There was a steady stream of people who were um, becoming members of the congregational church during that time period. Um, and so, so any number of those reasons might have persuaded Jane that it was time to, to join the church. Uh, and the Congregational Church was, you know, a respectable church. There were no African American churches in Wilton or New Canaan um, because there just wasn't the African American population to support them. Um, and so the Congregational Church was a church that made sense uh, to join at that point. Um, Jane later said that she joined the Presbyterian Church, and that's just flat out wrong. Um, she joined the Congregational Church. We have the records to show that. She probably said pre Presbyterian because lots of people referred to the Congregational Church as the Presbyterian Church at that time. Um, that's because the Congregationalists and the Presbyterians had sort of joined forces to evangelize the young nation uh, in 1801. They signed a document called the Plan of Union, and they kind of divided the nation up into districts. And so Jane lived in a congregational district, um, but one result of this plan was that people sort of got confused about the denominations that they were talking about, and they they referred to Congregationalists as Presbyterians all the time. That was common parlance. Um, and so for Jane to talk about these folks as pres Presbyterians makes perfect sense because lots of other people did that as well. Are they pretty similar in belief? Uh, they are very similar in belief, slightly different in polity. Um, and so the way the churches are organized and governed is different. Um, but in terms of doctrine, they're very similar. So it made sense for them to join forces. Hmm, interesting. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Quincy Newell. In our next conversation, we'll talk about the father of Jane's first child, Sylvester. Who was his father? There's speculation as to whether Jane was raped. Is that true? I mean, I think she has to see at some level, she has to see every male around her as a potential predator, right? But any male could also possibly be a potential ally, right? Um, so as a, I don't want to make her seem like just a victim, um, but it, I think women in general have to be really aware of their surroundings and of the people around them who may do them harm. Um, and that hasn't changed. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.